without objection. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, six years ago, I held a special order on a subject matter that I think is extremely important to this country and to the developed world, the issue of growing inequality. It's been four years since COVID-19 pandemic began, and it's more relevant now than ever because unfortunately, it's gotten worse. The concentration of wealth in the United States of America is not fair, it's not American, and it is driving multiple social and behavioral health issues that more and more research points to and verifies. The pandemic has laid bare the deep disparities that exist in the United States and worsen the gap between the richest and poorest Americans. And it has helped eviscerate in many ways American middle class. The president has tried his very best and in the two years the Democrats had control of both houses and the president was in the White House, we did much to begin to change this rising tide of inequality. Rising inequality incurs costs that harm us all, but not just those at the bottom of the income distribution. It hurts America. Next to me is a statistical diagram of the Gina quotient that's accepted by economists around the world as the best statistical measurement for inequality. And you can see just since 1993, it's steadily gone up with the pandemic at the end. I'm pleased to have a couple of my colleagues and friends to be here to speak on this, and I'd like to now welcome the gentleman from Tennessee to make a few comments. Thank you so much. I'm pleased to join you because this is such an important topic and a topic that I've talked about for a long time. Uh, the income inequality in our country has grown and grown and grown. And the tax cuts of Donald Trump, which I voted against, contributed to it greatly. Tax cuts that gave the wealthy much more money, corporations and individuals, and did not help the poor, and didn't really help the middle class much. My district is in Memphis, Shelby County and Tipton County, just north of, of Memphis. Because of that, I'm no stranger to high levels of poverty and inequality. According to the 2023 Poverty Fact Sheet by the University of Memphis, 21.4% of Memphians live in poverty. The overall poverty rate for black and Latino Memphians is almost double that of white and Caucasian residents. Roughly 27% for black and Latino residents compared to 10% of whites. The child poverty rate is 32.7, a number that has been declining in recent years due to the child tax credits, but still far too high, and we don't know how much the child tax credits will be available to people this coming year. In 2022, the child poverty rate in African American and Latino communities was three times that of white families, 30% to 10. What hope does that give young African American and Latino children? The root causes of poverty often come down to access and opportunity. Childhood poverty is directly related to the financial status of the children's parents. Many young adults in Memphis have parents and grandparents who are prohibited from buying houses in certain areas, redlining, which is still a practice in Memphis and has been highlighted recently when one of the banks in Memphis was charged with such and pled guilty to such, I believe. And that has restricted access to home loans and mortgage protections as well. Because of redlining, many families did not have the opportunity to buy desirable houses. These policies were legal until 1968, so it's not ancient history. The impact of redlining continues as many families were unable to build generational wealth. Now poor families need access to services like citywide internet, subsidized childcare, and supportive mortgage rates. And we've tried to do some of those things, but unfortunately it's not been a bipartisan effort. It's mostly been an effort by Democrats. Tennessee is nationally ranked as a low tax state, but that's not the case for the poorest families. The taxes are regressive. It's a sales tax dependent state, and that taxes the poor at the most regressive manner. The poorest 20% of Tennessee residents pay a significantly higher percentage of their income in state and local taxes than any other group in the state. Low income families are paying high amounts of taxes while at the same time receiving lower levels of access to services and opportunity for economic mobility. Tennessee remains as one of the 10 remaining states that have not expanded Medicaid. That is truly sorrowful and immoral. 
If Tennessee, and were, to, Tennessee were to expand as 40 other states in the District of Columbia have, lower earning workers would have access to affordable health care and their families would worry less about the impacts of seeking treatment for an illness. A billion plus dollars a year have been turned down by our state legislature because they don't care about taking care of the poor. Matthew 25 talks about healing. I saw people that were naked and I clothed them. I saw people that were sick and I fed them and I saw people who were sick and I healed them. Some people say they live by the Bible. If you want to know where my politics are, just look to the Bible. Well, some of those people that speak at the most don't know Matthew 25. Measures combating childhood poverty and closing the income wealth gap among diverse groups are vital in my district and hope to make more progress on the issue. I'll continue advocating for the child's tax credit which Ms. DeLauro has championed, encouraging Tennesseans to expand Medicaid, and seeking additional funds for education and job training, and supporting other policy to help those in need. I thank Mr. DeSalonay for having the moral courage and the will to bring this special order to the people that are watching. It's an important issue, and it pains me to see our country becoming more and more divided. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cohen. I'd now like, not like to recognize someone who spoke at my first effort at this, the very esteemed ranking member of the Appropriations Committee, Ms. DeLauro from Connecticut. Thank you. Thank, I thank the gentleman so very much. And I, I so appreciate what you are accomplishing here this evening is to shine a light on the issue of poverty in this, in, in, in this nation. And you know, we have searched and searched and searched over decades for what is the antidote to poverty, and particularly in, in child poverty. Um, and I, I, I'm, I'm often reminded, this might sound like a little nerdy, but you know, the, the uh, 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 Nobel laureate um, in economics, uh, Joseph Stieglitz, uh, once, and it's just a paraphrase of what he said, is that inequality is not the result of globalization or modernization, but it is, it is the result of policy choices. And you know, this body that we are blessed to be able to serve in deals with policy choices, which means that we can have a profound effect on poverty, child poverty, and reducing that in our nation. And I, I, I suppose I'll just reflect on, and I pick up a little from what Congressman Cohen said, you know, the, the House passed a tax bill last week that would continue to exacerbate child poverty in the United States. Public policy choices. So I want to say a thank you to Mr. DeSolnier bringing us together tonight. And you know, as I said and I so stated last week, I, I, in good conscience I couldn't vote for a, a deal that was so lopsidedly benefiting big corporations while failing to ensure a substantial tax cut to middle and working class families. It was deeply inequitable. We have seen the greatest rise in inequality, and we have seen corporations make super profits at the expense of the consumer. And so for me, it was a mockery of who representative government works for. Who are we here to support? The bill, it's massive tax cuts for big corporations, and it denies middle class families economic security that they had, and we were successful with the American Rescue Plan. We were successful in having a child tax credit. And to be truthful, I started out wanting to make it permanent. I was told that it can't be, it was too expensive, that it should be for five years. I, they said, no, it can't be for five years. Well, what about three years? No, it can't be three years. And they said, one year. And I was asked, will you take one year? Of course. 
with the expanded child tax credit. $3,000 for kids, you know, 6 to 17, $3,600 for six years and under, monthly benefits for a family. Um, and so I said, yes. And then I was also told at that time, Rosa, once it is out there, it's not going to go away. It went away. It expired. And we had a chance last week to redress that balance and bring it back. And in my view, that was a missed opportunity. And once again, it is there, taken away, pulling the rug out from under, working families, middle class families, vulnerable families, and driving them into poverty once again because we reduced the poverty rate. That's what the bill did. And now it's gone from 5.2% to 12.4%. Hunger has risen, and it went down when we had the child tax credit. And the tax credit was the largest middle class tax cut in history. Middle class tax cut. So we got billions of dollars in tax relief for the wealthy, and the way I put it, pennies for the poor. That's what it's about. You know? And you want to talk about cost benefit? returns $8 a child tax credit for every dollar spent. And we leave a trillion dollars. Child poverty in the United States costs us a trillion dollars every year. And we would, would return 84 cents on the dollar to the taxpayer with the child tax credit. So, you know, it was, it's a vast giveaway. Billionaires and corporations. Just a couple of examples. DISH, Network. At FedEx, Salesforce, T-Mobile, um, they pay no federal income tax under the Trump tax law. You think about it for a sec second. Netflix will have a negative tax rate in 2024, 2025 because of this tax bill. That means that they get money back. They pay no taxes. I, it's... And then on top of that, November 2023, they announced they would raise prices on subscribers. They add an extra $24 to $36 to what subscribers have to pay each year to maintain service. And yet, the same families will not see a child tax credit like they did under the American Rescue Plan. You know, it is absurd. Think about what people are telling you my colleague in California and my colleague in Tennessee. Families today are living paycheck to paycheck. They can't, something goes wrong, they can't make a $400 payment. That's what's going on in their lives. They're struggling to put food on the table, to pay their health care bills, to be able to get child care, you know? And groceries have skyrocketed. It's all there. Child care skyrocketed. Corporate profits, though, $3 trillion in 2023. They're not living paycheck to paycheck. They're going to take that money and buy back stock, which is what they've done in the past with this thing. It, was, it is our families that are bearing the brunt of inflation and high interest rates. Child tax credit is the antidote to child poverty in this country. It's a successful tool that lifted millions out of poverty literally overnight. So, you know, this is, you never, what hap what's happened happened, we move forward. And we will continue to make the fight for a permanent child tax credit in this country because we know how successful it was, we know what it did for families, and to the naysayers who said, one, we couldn't raise it to 3,000 or 3,600 and that we could never get it monthly, well, so be it, we did it and it succeeded. And those who said that people are going to dog it, they're not going to go to work, they're going to buy drugs with it, they're going to, you know, all by, with data, with data from the Columbia School of Social Policy that said people went to work because they could afford childcare. And they were able to use this money for essential necessities to buy those groceries. And you know what? Maybe for their kid, they could send them on a class trip or her on a class trip, which they weren't able to do because they couldn't afford it in the past. So it is the best thing 
that we can do to improve the economic well-being and security of American families today. Let's bring back the largest middle class tax cut in the history of this country. I can't thank you enough. We need to continue to shine the light that it is our public policy decisions that create inequity and inequality. Let's turn that around and deal with the policies that do turn that around. And I can't thank the gentleman enough uh, for, for putting together this special order. And I can't thank you enough. You know, some people accuse us on the other side of socialism. You and I, who learned our rosary and our Catholic and Christian upbringing, Amen. it was about the social contract of St. Matthew oh, and the Bible of, to those who much is given, much is expected. Much is expected. Our, our Catholicism is rich mm -hmm. with social justice. And I look at, in God we trust, and this body really needs to carry out social justice in a way that it doesn't do these days. You can have individual responsibility in this country, and you can have social responsibility, that's right. and that's when we've been the most successful. Mm -hmm. When Eisenhower was president, when the middle class was strong, and the union movement was strong, and people got the GI Bill, and he implemented in his own way what Franklin Roosevelt put together, that's when this, this economy was the best. It was growing at over 6% GDP year over year, mm -hmm. and it was benefiting everybody. Everyone. And I'll tell you, is one of the things that brought me to this was as a, when I was a Republican restaurant owner, you would read in the trade journals about disposable income. And this is our friend Bob Reich's argument and Stiglitz's argument. Mm -hmm. If you don't have disposable income, it hurts everybody. Unfortunately, uh, now people at places like the Roosevelt Institute, our friends, say that no more and more the top 1% is just selling to themselves and gating themselves off. Mm -hmm. And as Thomas Piketty has said, the inevitability in Western history, when you get to this level of inequality, is social disruption and civil distress. Mm -hmm. And if we don't fix it here, we'll have more of what happened a few years ago outside this chamber. Amen. Amen. Thank, thank you, you so much. I thank my colleague. Madam Speaker, I'm going to go through my presentation, but I do want to thank my two colleagues. Uh, there may be one or two others on the way. I want to start by talking about poverty in America. I'm going to date myself again. Michael Harrington, the other America, uh, talked about poverty over 50 years ago, about how people in rural America were suffering. But we had the optics of how well people were doing um, in places where fortunate enough where many of us live. But it was rural America that Michael Harrington talked about. And again, he was talking about the social contract in the Gospel of Matthew. Nearly 40 million people, or 11% of the U.S. population, lived in poverty in 2021. One in three Americans live in a household making $55,000 or less. And while many of them are technically above the official poverty line, they're still struggling to make ends meet, that $400 in unexpected expense. In 2019, the U.S. child poverty rate was double that of our peer nations, including Germany, Canada, and South Korea. The relief we delivered to families during the pandemic made a massive impact on people's lives, including the leadership of Ms. Delo Delora. The expanded child tax credit, which she men mentioned, robust unemployment insurance, and emergency rental assistance all helped to keep families afloat during unprecedented economic hardship and an international pandemic. Now we're coming out of it, and those funds are going away. They did their intended purpose but now we're at a tipping point. The expanded child checks tax credit alone led to stunning reduction in child poverty. This effort, spearheaded by my good friend, Ms. Delore, kept 5.3 million people above the poverty line. And between 2020 and 2021, child poverty rate plunged to 4.5 percentage points. As Ms. Delore said, they weren't spending this on anything but trying to survive, provide shelter, transportation, and get to work for their family and their kids. But after House Republicans allowed the child tax credit to expire, the poverty rate for children more than doubled from the historic low of 5.2% in 2021 to 12.4% the next year. If the child tax credit had been sustained at the levels from the pandemic, 
Three million additional American children would have been kept out of poverty. Three million. I wonder what they're doing this evening. According to the analysis of the Center for Budget and Policy Priorities, while the child tax credit in 2021, in six months we reduced child poverty almost half. We know how to do this, folks. We know what works. We just have to invest and prioritize lifting up the most vulnerable people amongst us. And what will they do? The vast majority will work and be honorable and take that money for a very high return on investment for all of us. So wealth distribution. As you can see in this chart, data from the Congressional Budget Office shows that from 1989 to 2019, the total wealth held by families in the top 10% increased by 240% from about $24 trillion to $82 trillion. $24 trillion to $82 trillion for the top 10%. While the wealth held by families in other percentiles increased far more slowly or even remained flat, wealth is skewed to the top of the wealth distribution in the United States of America. Families in the top 10% of distribution have held more than two-thirds of all wealth and families in the bottom half of the distribution held only 2% of total wealth. I, like most Americans, want people to be compensated for their creativity, for their innovation, their hard work. But this confrontation, this distribution punishes 90% of the American public and even higher when you look, get deeper into the numbers. The total wealth held by American families triple from 1989 to, 2009, to 2019, but the growth, growth was far from uniform for everyone. Over those three decades, 30 years, three decades, families in the top 10% saw their share of wealth increase by around 30%. For families in the bottom half of the wealth distribution, their share declined from 4% to just 2%. So even before the pandemic started, which we know has worsened this, the concentration of wealth among those at the very top has gotten significantly worse. This is not about class warfare. This is about fighting for all of us. This has been true in our history. When we went through the Gilded Age, similar thing happened. We got depression and two world wars. Who fought those wars? Who fought to try to get back so that they take care of their families? Not the wealthiest, but most Americans who are going out and working hard to get a, a paycheck. And as Mr. Laura said, unfortunately, history is repeating ourselves. And my fear is coming out of the pandemic, even with our growth, even what the president's done with unemployment at historic lows and wages coming up, it's not enough. We have to change this, and it should be in a bipartisan, analytical basis in this House and in this Congress. What we've done has had real impacts on those who are left out. It's not just that those at the top are better off than everyone else, as the richest among us are able to concentrate their wealth. They lock away their money in investments that research shows never get spent in the economy. Middle-income people spend their money. They consume. They go to restaurants. That's better for everybody. Wealthier people, research by Stiglitz and others shown, is generally retained in that group of people, of people, and it's even more so. It's becoming more concentrated as they spend money amongst themselves and leave everyone else out. As inequality increases, it becomes more difficult for those not born into privilege to climb the ladder and build a better life, further enriching and growing inequality. This country is supposed to be merit and hard work and a quality of opportunity. We're doing the opposite right now in this country, and it's because of policies here. Let's talk about worker compensation. This is not worker compensation as when you get injured, although that should be better. This is wages versus capital. Lincoln once famously said when he first, his first address to Congress, before the Civil War, when he was trying to hold the country together, he said, wages, labor in his word, and capital must always be equal and balanced in the United States. For if capital ever becomes dominant, we've lost democracy. Despite working harder, despite being more educated, despite being more productive, most American workers, their wages have grown exceptionally slowly compared to the growth in productivity compared to this CEO compensation. 
For the last 40 years, the gap between productivity and worker compensation wages has increased significantly. Americans are working in a more productive fashion. They're working more productively versus their com international competitors, but they're not seeing their wages go up and their disposable income sacrifices even more. A typical worker's wage growth has lagged far behind gains in productivity over that time. So it's the idea that if you worked harder and you were more productive, individual merit and responsibility is not borne out in the research and the numbers. If we look at this graph, graph we can see productivity has grown by nearly 62% over the last 40 years. But the average hourly pay of the typical worker grew by only 17%. This gap makes the difference between people being compensated fairly in their wages versus people who have the good fortune to be able to invest in capital. And this is what Lincoln was talking about. Put simply, workers are more productive than ever before, but are not properly compensated for it. Until the late 1970s, workers' compensation wages climbed together with productivity, but then it began to change and diverge. And it diverges when we abandon the policies that prioritized spreading the benefits of growth to workers, to all Americans, wealthy and middle income, instead of what we're doing now. It benefited from a strong labor movement. President Eisenhower once famously said, only a fool would try to keep an American worker from joining a labor union. President Eisenhower said that. CEO pay, another contributor to rising inequality, is rising CEO pay. This is an ongoing issue, but it's something we've really seen balloon over the last three years. While so many hardworking Americans have struggled to make ends meet during the pandemic, some CEOs are making more money than ever. The average top CEO compensation in 2022 was $25.2 million, and it continues to increase even as low-income Americans and middle-income Americans are forced to make do with wages that year after year affords them less in terms of purchasing power. In 2022, CEOs were paid 344 times as much as a typical worker. The ratio of CEO to typical worker compensation was 344 to 1. In 1989, that ratio was 59 to 1. In the 50s and 60s, it was even lower. In 1965, it was 21 to 1. I've introduced the CEO Accountability and Responsibility Act, which would increase corporate taxes on companies with extreme disparities between their CEO and their workers' pay. We need bold proposals like this one to help put an end to runaway corporate greed and restore the balance of power back to workers. A balance, as Lincoln said. Stock buypacks. Over the last 40 years, tax laws, regulatory change, court decisions, and new corporate behaviors have led to shareholder-first corporations. That's the corporate veil they hide under, behind where CEOs and managers focus on share price and investors, directing corporate funds to shareholder buy payouts. Corporate profits, or even corporate debt, may have once funded innovating new projects in research and development, and new hires and worker wages, or like the Germans do, reinvested in continuous training, back into community colleges and apprenticeship programs, for a lifetime of learning for workers, craftsmen. In the 1960s and 1970s, 40 cents were invest invested for every dollar a company earned or borrowed, but since the 1980s, invested back in their workforce, less than 10 cents of each borrowed dollar is invested that way. Instead, executives are using their profits to pay themselves and their wealthy shareholders. Over the past 30 years, payouts to wealthy shareholders have averaged 90%, 90% of all corporate profits. We need Robin Hood. This has led to skyrocketing use of stock buybacks. When companies purchase back their own stock from shareholders in an open market and reabsorb the ownership that was previously sold to the other investors, the use of stock buybacks was essentially banned, except under rare circumstances, until Ronald Reagan and his Security Exchange Commission. In 1982, a strategy for companies to artificially raise their open market stock prices and boost earnings per share. 
1982, during the Reagan administration, the Security Exchange Commission passed a rule that deregulated buybacks, allowing companies to buy their own stock without being charged with stock manipulation and incentivizing them, as Mr. Laura said, to avoid taxes. Where did those taxes go? Not to all of us, but back to the top 1% and their investors. Again, Lincoln, wages and capital should be balanced. The increased stock prices do not reflect an actual improvement in the processes of the company and may serve as a cover for financial difficulties in the long run. This is why I think Republicans and Democrats should be concerned, perhaps for different reasons and motivations, but the underlying rot in our economy is a problem as exemplified by Thomas Picardy and as he, il he illustrated in his detailed history of other economies when this happened around the world. Stock buybacks are just an excuse for companies to reward stockholders and increase dividends while avoiding employee wages and compensation and investments back into their companies. In an investigation of 449 companies listed on the S&P from 2003 to 2012, companies used 54% of earnings to buy back its own stock and 37% on dividends of those earnings. The increased use of stock buybacks by corporations is a way that companies pad their profits and their mediocre corporate management and support their executives at the expense of all of us and their workers. Over the last five years, the top 20 S&P 500 companies spent a staggering $1.24 trillion buying back their own shares. Last year, Chevron, which is headquartered in my district, said it would triple its budget for stock buybacks from $75 billion, and Meta, the parent of Facebook, Facebook, which is near my district in the Bay Area, unveiled a $40 billion payback. The Brookings Institute looked at the actions of 22 iconic American corporations who alone employ over 7 million frontline workers, including the world's most popular brands in retail, delivery, and entertainment sectors, like Amazon, Disney, FedEx, Home Depot, and Hilton. In the first two years of the pandemic, they earned even more. In that time period, company shareholders at these companies grew one and a half trillion dollars richer, while workers got less than 2% of the benefit. 1.5 trillion and 2% of the benefit for their workforce. Doesn't sound like what Lincoln wanted. And they spent nearly 40% of their profit on stock buybacks. Rising shareholder payments are linked with declining employee compensation and increased income inequality. Gains of stock buybacks are also concentrated amongst the already uber wealthy. Among 50, around 58% of American households own stock. That's good. But about 93% of household stock market wealth is held by the top 10%. While our investment in good, strong uh, pension retirement, and I'm proud to be the ranking member on the Health, Employment, Labor, and Pension Subcommittee of the Education and Labor Committee, those investments in everybody's pensions are good and benefit everybody. The problem is most of those investments are going to the wealthiest amongst us. And it creates the risk for all of us when this stops and it's not handled appropriately for everyone's benefit. An analysis by the Institute of Policy Studies showed that the richest 10% of US households own roughly 42.7 trillion in stock market wealth. And the richest 1% own 25 trillion. The bottom half of households own less than a half a trillion dollars. Top 1% represents 20, owns 25 trillion in the stock market. The bottom half holds less than a half than a trillion dollars, half a trillion dollars. Just 1% of stock market wealth. Sad. Corporations are spending more and more of their net incomes on buybacks rather than innovation and capital improvements and compensating their workers well for more productivity and ultimately more innovation and more disposable income for people like myself when I was in the restaurant business to go out and support those other jobs. Corporations are spending more and more of their net incomes or buybacks in recent years to enrich their executives and their shareholders and it comes at real cost for their employees who have decidedly not seen 
the same kind of increases in their take-home pay or their disposable income or their ability to go out and consume and take care of their kids. Labor unions and strikes, workers across industry are fed up with lag lagging wages and the benefits that are disproportionately given to the top 1%. This year, more workers are recognizing their collective bargaining power and are walking off the job or threatening to do so to fight for their rights. In Hollywood, in auto factories, in food service across the country, workers are fighting for fair compensation, safe workplaces, and job security. Public approval for labor unions in this country has skyrocketed to over 60%. Americans are waking up to these disparities and the unfairness and the lack of us supporting the American dream for everybody and rewarding hard work and responsibility. And then there's the outside influence of the uber wealthy in elections right here in this house. It's been a big issue in the United States and has drastically expanded since the five to four Supreme Court decision on Citizens United, allowing for independent expenditures. The Citizens United decision enabled corporations and other outside groups to spend unlimited amounts of money on elections. It opened the door to unlimited donations to super PACs, which function as a surrogate to campaigns despite being banned from coordinating directly with them. These numbers have skyrocketed. The impacts have been far reaching and continue to get worse every election cycle. Billionaires alone provided 15% of all federal midterm election financing in 2022, according to the Brennan Center analysis. Just 21 of the biggest donor families, 21 families, each spent at least $15 million in one election cycle, or a total of $783 million in that cycle. $783 million. Do you see the connection between our policy and how people get here and stay here? The effective deregulation of campaign money and the expansion of dark money groups who don't have to disclose their donors are destructive to democracy. Clearly, Citizens United has helped reinforce the view that our government primarily serves the interests of the rich, all of our government, all three branches, all too often, and that there's no need for most citizens to participate in democracy. All right, those are the economic, social con concerns that I have and what we're under. Doesn't sound good. Now there's more and more research in the connection to you as individuals in this country, to the people who despair, the so-called diseases and deaths of despair that are all too frequently in rural areas in the Midwest and the South regionally. But they're all across the country, including in the Bay Area where I represent. Behavioral health, substance abuse, Opioid addictions have been well recorded by research and writing. This to me is where the tragedy of tragedies is far beyond policy. It's the reality of how Americans have to live, that $400 and the despair, the anxiety and the, dis the distrust in this institution that is better than this, as my friend and colleague Elijah Cummings used to say all the time, we're better than this, Republicans and Democrats. So let's talk about health consequences of inequality. It's important to look at the effect it has on health physically and mentally and on the fabric of our society. Economic inequality is a cause for poor health. As one re researcher said, English researcher said 20 years ago, inequality in a society are in lockstep with individual suffering. As the gap between the riches and the poorest Americans gets larger, the health discrepancies between these groups increase as well, and they're getting exponentially worse. As health declines, it has the adverse effects on quality of life, on our economy, on our workforce productivity, and our health care costs. Life expectancy in the United States has been declining for decades. And a lot of this is directly attributable to these diseases of despair. It has only worsened since the beginning of the pandemic. I thought we would come together, but instead it's gotten worse. There are stark differences in the average life expectancies of the Americans at the bottom of the income, dis income distribution and those at the top. While the health of the wealthiest Americans have remained relatively stagnant, while that of the poorest Americans has fallen significantly. 
where in spite of the ACA, we're still spending the most as a percentage of GDP on quality health care. Unfortunately, if you're wealthy, even with the ACA, you're going to get better health care in a caste system of health care, which will cause your own life expectancy to go down. And this is a regional problem, and there's differences in a regional problem, as exemplified by an extensive study by the Kaiser Foundation. There is a strong relationship with the level of income inequality and the percentage of population that suffers from mental health. So it's physical health, but mental health. The prevalence of anxiety disorders, impulse control disorders, and even severe mental health illnesses are, are correlated to inequality. Chronic stress or lack of social support increases the risk of ill health, both physical and mental. The CDC has recently highlighted the concerning trend, not concerning trend, the outrage of the mental health of high school students, our kids, which is worsened by the COVID-19 pandemic. In 2021, more than four in 10 students felt persistently sad or hopeless and depressed. More than one in five seriously considered attempting suicide, and particularly for young women, as the CDC and the Surgeon General has pointed out to us. This is a crisis, folks. For all of us who are fortunate enough to have kids, we should be extremely sensitive to what we're giving as a legacy and the tragedy that we're, we're committing to the future of this country and young people, irrespective of where they live or which party their families and parents are registered to. We should be doing a lot more to support mental health and behavioral health in this country, and that includes making mental health care more affordable and more accessible. Since the ACA in parity, there's been a 300% increase in people seeking out behavioral health. There's been a similar decrease in the number of young people going into the field because of the exorbitant cost of getting a degree. Talk about supply and demand. Social support and social networks are important for psychological well-being, both for individuals in this country, and there is a very tied connection. These are important determinants of population health, and they deteriorate in unequal societies. Aggressively targeting income inequality will lead to better health outcomes for more Americans. The same research by uh, English experts years ago said that, again, the correlation between both, but they also said the remedy was not just more services. The biggest, most effective remedy is dealing with the societal tax and regulatory uh, impact of this concentration of wealth and continuing to reward it. Excuse me just a second, Madam Speaker. So let's talk about global income inequality because America, as bad as we are and we've led on this unfortunately, it's an economic toll across the country in the developed world. The developed world, the rest of the developed world, as you've heard me say, creates more safety net, but it's still a problem in a global economy. The economic toll of the pandemic has been highly unequal. A uh, report from March 2020 to the end of 2020, global billionaire wealth, wealth global, not the U.S., my previous numbers were the U.S., has increased by almost $4 trillion. By contrast, global workers' combined earnings fell by $3.7 trillion. Individuals owning more than 100,000 in assets make up 13% of the global population, but they own 85.2% of the global wealth. Globalism did not raise all boats, as we were promised. A rising tide, as Jack Kennedy said many years ago, turns out in this economy, globally and in the United States, has risen, has only raised those of the very biggest yachts. But having said all that, wealth concentration in the U.S. is worse. Statistics show that the top 1% of the United States holds 40% of national wealth, a far greater share than in other developed countries. In other industrialized nations, the richest 1% own 27%. Pretty bad, but not as bad as 40%. U.S. median wealth is lower than in many other countries. The United States has more wealth than any other nation, the wealthiest country in the history of the world. But the top-heavy distribution of wealth leaves typical American adults with far less wealth than their counterparts in other individual countries. 
Changes to tax policy that benefits the rich and large corporations are a key driver, as Ms. Delora said, in rising inequality. Our actions here, particularly under the last administration, not only increased the deficit dramatically, but they increased the lopsidedness of fairness in the American economy and politics. According to the Institute of Policy Studies analysis by data collected by known uh, wonderful economists, Annual Saez, who's a neighbor, teaches at the University of California the sh and at Stanford, the share of U.S. taxes paid to the top 1%, 0.1%, was just slightly higher in 2018 than in 1962, despite the more than tripling of their share of the nation's wealth. By contrast, the bottom 50% saw their share of U.S. wealth drop by more than half during this period. The top marginal rate in 1962 was 91% compared to 37% in 2018. Our policies have made things worse. I always believe that that expression in the Bible, to those who are given much, much is expected. That used to be what the greatest generation and their CEOs believed. Great companies like Motorola, General Motors, and Ford. In those days, as Ford said when he founded the, T, the, the Model T, he wanted his workers to be able to afford his car. That was the magic of an America that was a free market, mixed market economy that benefited everybody. And the wealthy left appropriately very well, but not with the obscene, obscene concentrations of wealth. I often think, well, you know, you can't take it with you. What are you going to take with you? Hopefully a guilty conscience that you realize that when this country needed you, what did you do? You just kept making more and more for yourself, but not realizing how important it was to the rest of the country and what's happening to future generations. Madam Speaker, I'll close with a quote by Louis Brandeis. And Lincoln spoke in, 16, or in 1841, at the beginning of what would become the Civil War. Brandeis, a brilliant, Jurist said, and similarly, when we were struggling with disparities of wealth and making sure every American felt that they were part of this, they were some part of something, even if it was a simple thing, a Frank Capra simple thing, that you were part of something bigger than yourself, that you were Harry Bailey being responsible for the homeowners who came in and borrowed money from your savings and loan. Louis Brandeis said, we can have democracy in this country or we can have great wealth concentrated in the hands of the very fewest amongst us, but we can't have both. It's our decision, members of Congress, if at this moment, Republicans and Democrats, we could start looking at this and realizing, as I did when I was a small restaurant owner in the Bay Area, successful, but I looked every day at those journals up for point of sale real estate retailers, and I realized that the working people who came into my restaurant couldn't go out to eat. It's one of the first things people stop when they can't afford, when they have to worry about paying their mortgage or paying their car or getting their kids to childcare if they can afford that. Those are the moments that we are confronting. Jack Kennedy once said at his first inaugural speech out here on the East Steps, in his Ask Not speech, he said, one of my favorite quotes, he said, few generations get to defend freedom at its ultimate moment of threat. And he said, I don't despair of this. I don't sh shrink from this. I embrace it. And he said that the fight we put to this, I'm paraphrasing, will bring light to the world. That's the challenge we have. Whether you're a conservative Republican who believes in the Chicago School which I believe caused all these problems, trickle down doesn't work. It works sometimes, but not doesn't work. We have a problem with the American economy. It's affecting our physical health, our life expectancy, and our mental health. As Brandeis said, we can have a democracy, and a paraphrase for Brandeis, or we can have opportunity, opportunity that's rich for everybody. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I yield back. Oh, one last thing, sorry. If I could, if you could indulge me, 
my staff is reminding me, I have uh, something I want to submit for the record from my good friend and neighbor, Barbara Lee, who started the in Income Inequality um, Caucus of the House of Representatives. If I could submit this for the record. Thank you. The gentleman, the 